On today's show, it is part two with myself and Glenn Willis talking all things Garrison Matthews, and it's coming to you right now. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1712 of the Lawton Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Thursday evening into Friday, and this is part two. So stop what you're doing right now. If you did not listen to part one, I recommend starting with part one of this conversation, but part two right now with myself and Glenn Willis of ATL on 29, talking all things Garrison Matthews as part of our player capsule series. Also, today's episode is brought to you by the folks at Prize Picks. This is the most exciting way to play down fantasy sports. The place to go is prizepicks.com slash Lawton NBA and use code Lots on NBA for first time deposit match up to $100. Check it out now at Prize Fix. Also, I encourage you at the top of the podcast, beyond listening to part one, to go ahead and subscribe to the show anywhere you might find podcasts. That includes Spotify and Apple, as well as YouTube on the video side. And no more further delays here. Let's dive in. Myself and Glenn, part two on Garrison Matthews. I want to bridge a little bit to the defensive side of the floor with Garrison. Obviously, not his sexy side of the court. We started with offense for a reason, that's his primary appeal. But uh, if anybody listened to these podcasts before knows, we're, we're going to do the whole picture. And, um, you know, Garrison will mix it up. You referenced that already in our discussion. He's not afraid of contact. He's physical. He is limited, what I would say, is, as far as his tools are concerned. He's only 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, he's played a lot of three with the Hawks. Like two and three are sometimes interchangeable. But he's played a lot of times where he was like – the bigger wing on the court, like if he's playing with Trey and DeJounte or if he's playing with, you know, two guards and him, like he's really a shooting guard is what he is. Like, I, I don't mean to yeah. pencil home too, but, but you know what I mean? Like he's shooting guard size. He's not a super athlete. He's an NBA athlete, but he's not, a, I, I would say he's probably below average for an NBA two guard athleticism wise. So what can he do defensively? Where is he defensively in your mind? Like paint the overall picture of what, like, cause I think people, I don't want to make it too simple, but people might think, oh, 6'4", 6'5", white guy shooter, he must be terrible defensively. The numbers are, all, are, are always great either, but like, what do you actually see from him on defense? Yeah, so, I mean, he's one of those guys that he has some tools to work with, um, but probably, you know, similar to size, just, you know, 10, 15% below average in terms of kind of what the makeup is there. Yep. And so the base, the full baseline of, of what you'd want, kind of the mid, mid-level baseline is not quite there. And when it comes to guys like that, it really co- does come down to technique. A big one is being on time, especially when you're a low man. Um, and he got a lot better. I mean, the first month of the season, maybe a month and a half of the season, it was pretty ugly anytime he had to rotate the front of the rim. He was too deep. He was too close to the rim. He was, you know, not as early as he could have been and those sorts of things. And when he has that kind of size issue, like being a f- one step in front of the rim, is just really not going to get it done. So getting all the way up to the dotted line, maybe even a little bit above the dotted line. And you saw him get a little higher and higher and be more on time and be more proactive. And so for me, it just came down to his habits got more, got cleaner and got more consistent as as it goes so um so i feel like he showed me he was demonstrating the things he needs to do to be viable defensively which is being connected communicating being on time being in the exact right spot like with the smaller you are the more precise you have to be in terms of location help location and all that sort of stuff and then even as in times when he was part of switching lineups just you know being just as physical enough, you know, at the point of the the switch, um, you know, creating that little kind of hesitation of the ball handler so that the switch, you have a little time to have a, a, a cleaner switch execution. And so for me, I felt like he was showing, you know, nice attention to detail increasingly across the season. He's never going to be a guy that you roll out there as a stopper. No. Uh, but if, but for a guy who's going to play, you know, 12 to 14 minutes, you know, maybe a little bit more depending upon how much more shooting might be on the floor in some matchups. You know, he's a, he's a guy that it, you just want him to do, do the basics well enough. And I thought that as the season went on, that got he got better and better and better in the area of in terms of principles, fundamentals, and basics and, and showed me that he was paying a lot of attention to detail uh, in terms of kind of what he needs to do. So like I said, just 
being higher, you know, being more on time and stuff like that just got increasingly better across the season. Yeah, I think that he definitely has improved defensively. I think that they also probably figured out what he can and can't do a little more. And this is going to sound like I'm being negative about him, which I'm not. I think ideally you would want him to be your worst defender on the court. And that's not a shot at Garrison. It's just the reality of what he is. Right. Ideally, he would be your worst defender. And far too many times on the Hawks, given their constraints, he's not the worst defender. And that puts him in a in a bad spot. Because, like, you know, whether it's Trey, whether – you know, it doesn't mean – there's lots of guys that has been along the way. But, like, he's not the best fit when he's got, I'm in the middle of several defensive weakness weaknesses or weak points. That's not a great thing because then you're relying on him too much. And he does foul, which we'll get into more in a second, a lot. But yeah, I think that's it's important to note that he has improved. I will say this though, just to be a little bit of a counter, his defensive all-in-one metrics are not good. Now, part of that's the the team. A lot of the guys on the team have ba- have bad metrics from this year, in particular because the defense the, the team was terrible defensively. That's going to be what it is. Actually, if you if, if you look at the on-offs, they were better with Garrison on the court defensively than off. Now, as a fit, as, as a role player. I don't want to ascribe that to him. I don't think he was changing their defense for the better necessarily, but they it, it does kind of tell you that they were able to function defensively with him on the court, which is a, a good thing. He wasn't getting them killed. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's ideally he would be hiding a little bit more than he ha- than he was able to hide, I think, on this roster. Because even if he's playing next to Bogey, I mean, those guys actually had some pretty decent success together um, in the in the lineup data, but this should be pretty obvious, but you you don't really want to play Garrison and Bogey together defensively on the way. Yeah. yeah. And then Sadiq too, before like Sadiq yeah. was real, Sadiq was improving defensively. You he, know, did, the he, last... he was early in the year. It was pretty rough for Sadiq. Oh, it I was, say. it was really bad. Yeah, yeah. Earlier in the year. And then you had, I mean, I feel like there was probably some moments where it was Garrison plus Bogey plus Sadiq. And it's like, Oh, the house is on fire. And, yeah. and then, and then, and then Trey, and Trey or even DJ at a point, like and then you All have, right. it's All four right. spots. Yeah, it's that's a fair yeah. drill. It's not, yeah. and, that, and that's not on. It's, it's hard to, and all of these, we should always say this out loud. On all of these player capsules, like it's impossible to isolate a player in without a without, which is why we try to give you a lot of context. With Garrison, it's like that's why as broad as, as I was trying to be there, it'd be great if he was your worst defender. He just hasn't been their worst defender a lot, which puts him in a weird spot. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but for me, I think I think if you know if he if you got Quinn to sit down and kind of give you a, a one minute kind of overview, he would say. Garrison improved. Garrison made progress. He Garrison did. became a more solid defender. He was, you know, doing the basics and and those sorts of things. And he, you know, he's willing to take charges. Um, there, I mean, it's kind of <laughs> funny, you know. I a few interactions on Twitter. I always enjoy watching the the primary people covering the other team when the Hawks play. Mm-hmm. And just some of the comments you'll see about Garrison from them, it's like you know, people will you know roll on their eyes. And it, I mean, some of it is pretty funny it's it's fair i mean honestly like i mentioned earlier about his what he's known for around the league it's like okay shooter charge drawing all that stuff but i mean i wish i had the charge i didn't pull the charge number but he was near the team lead i don't think he was in the team lead by the end of the season but when you look at the per minute numbers as far as charges drawn he was number one on the team and he tries to draw charges and that leads to blocking fouls that leads to him being annoyed uh to the opponents a lot of the time um it also leads to, I've teed this up, I'll just say it now, Garrison this year averaged 5.6 fouls per 100 possessions. That is insanely high for a yeah. shooting guard. Yeah. Like, that's around where Okongwu has been, and we've all kind of poked fun at Okongwu's foul rate in the past. You shouldn't be fouling that much as a shooting guard. Like that, that's, a, that's an incredibly high number, and part of that's his, his playing style. When you try to draw charges, you're going to draw a lot of blocks, etc. And look, it's, a, it's not a huge sample size, but man, my, I know I know that was more of a confirmation of my eye test. Like, I already had it written down in my notes, fouls too much. And I went and looked it up because I'm I raised my hand. I did not know what his foul rate was. It's not it's not a stat that I'm usually tracking during the season. Yeah. What's Garrison's foul rate? Um I looked it up and I was like I started laughing. I was like, well, that does that does back it up what you see on what you see on film. And it, and it's funny because when you see him pick up a foul instead of a charge, sometimes if you if you have a, if you ever want to just kind of go back and look at go to NBA.com and kind of go through his fouls. You'll see. Oh, he drew, he got a charge here. The guy with the ball is a below average ball handler, right? Or oh, he got a foul here. Well, this is a, a guy who's a really good ball handler. Trying to navigate a charge from a guy who's a really good ball handler is almost impossible. 
right? They're, they're going to navigate around you. They're going to uh, kind of create the angle that takes away your opportunity to kind of get set and, and such. If you get, if it's like a, a, a lower uh, capability ball handler, then, and that's probably where the next step comes in his ability to kind of limit his fouls is just reading, like, I'm not going to get a charge on this guy. So I'm just going to try to funnel him to help or, or whatever it is, you know, you know, try to deny middle as opposed to just trying to take that charge. Cause it, that does really matter who the ball handler is in terms of kind of what your decision is and what you're going to try to do there. And if you go back and look through all of those, you'll see times where it's a, you know, Donovan Mitchell, he's trying to take a charge on Donovan Mitchell's going to, you know, he's, Beat he's you. way too experienced <laughs> and skilled yeah. to kind of fall into that bait. If you got, a, if you got, you know, um, you know, Cam Johnson kind of beating a, you know, attacking a closeout, he's more straight line, right handed guy. Great. Go for, go for that charge. Um, but they, but but situation really does matter in terms of what your read is there and what you're you know what you're trying to make happen. Today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks and get on the playoff action right now with a hundred times the money on Prize Picks as you in the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. That's right. For example, you turn ten dollars into one thousand dollars with an entry today on Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. It's looking for every single sports fan from basketball to hockey to even League of Legends, everything in between. Prize Picks is the best way to get on the action in sports in more than thirty states across the country. That includes Georgia as well as California and Texas. Prize Picks they also offer injury insurance. Your injuries can stay in play even if. One of your players happens to be injured, and they're really simple to operate at Price Picks. I can make a pick and submit an injury just in 60 seconds or less. That's huge for me. One of the big reasons that I've been playing there for quite some time now, really for months and years at this point. They have quick withdrawals, they have easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of stat types and players that you can't find anywhere else. Helps you make the Price Picks app the number one fantasy sports app. And you want to download the Price Picks app today and use promo code Locked On NBA for a first time deposit match up to $100. Again, download the app, use pro- promo code Locked On Locked On NBA when you get there. That is code locked on NBA when you get there. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Price Picks. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors and Passion Drive and Patience with the formula for winning championships. That's also the formula for keeping your ride or die alive with eBay Motors. They have everything you need to maintain your vehicle. Also live it up to peak performance. They have roof racks. They have exhaust kits, superchargers, LED headlights, Anything you're looking for and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors is going to have you covered across the board. They have over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for with the folks at eBay Motors. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money is coming back to you. Because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber. You are never burning cash. With all the parts that you need, the prices that you're looking for, it's easy to turn your car into an MVP and bring home that win that you are seeking. Keep your ride or die alive right now at ebaymotors.com. One more time, the place to go is ebaymotors.com. eBay guaranteed fits only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Yeah, I'd like to ask Garrison about this. He's not the most open guy. Like, I think he's pretty quiet. He, you know, I, I, I like to wonder what he's in his brain because, look, not to psychoanalyze, but like he was undrafted out of a small school I'm sure along the way, my know, daughter's probably, college. My daughter's yeah. I was gonna. College, I was yeah. teeing. I was teeing that up for you. It's one. Of yeah. your, it's one of your bits you do with Kevin a lot. Uh, but no, <laughs> it's. Uh, but it's. It's you know he was not someone that was ever told he was going to be an NBA player. You know what I mean? Like I think somewhere along the way he thought this is this could be something that I can I could I can do. I can throw my body around. I can be physical, and drawing charges is look. And sometimes it's, it's it's great. I mean, but I think you made a great point there about the the competition, and being smart with it. And I think his his natural instinct is to just throw himself in there, and that can be good. You you rather have that than not. I think with someone with that has his physical limitations, I'm glad he's has he defaults to more aggressive than less aggressive. Because if he was less aggressive, he'd be worse. I think defensively, um, it's just one of those things where you got to kind of try to harness it in the in the right direction. I'd like to know what he thought what he thought about that. If, if I give him true serum, but I, I think a lot of it might come down to like Garrison just. He's had to work every step of the way. He's never been fully entrenched. Even this year, he was not fully entrenched until he kind of had to be for injury reasons. I don't think he's ever gone into a season as like, I'm definitely going to play. And to his credit, this is what, I think four years in a row, he has just willed himself into an NBA rotation. He, he was starting games and for bad teams in Washington and Houston, he was in, he ended up starting a bunch of games, but like, it was like, who's this Garrison Matthews guy? Like I'm a, I'm, I covered, I covered the draft that he would have ostensibly been in. He wasn't going to get drafted. He was nowhere near getting drafted. And he, he just willed himself into all of that stuff. And it's a good thing. I think that that chip on his shoulder is taking him a long way, but I wonder if it gets him in trouble sometimes too, where it's like his, his default is like, I'm going to put my nose in there and see what happens. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so that, that's exactly right. And and I think he needs to be more diverse in his approach and, and what he tries to make happen. And But he's a guy who needed to play to get those repetitions to kind of work through that and probably still yep. needs to play um, some more. But, I mean, the thing that I appreciate is sometimes it's like, okay, this guy's got to get better in areas X, Y, and Z. The effort is always there. It's always. Right? And so that's, that's unquestionable. Yeah, the other thing that I guess I feel like I don't really have a perspective on, you know, is can he do more as a rebounder? You know, and it wasn't great this year. Yeah, and I mean, and he was playing. To your point, he was playing a position. You know, that um, guys with a little bit more size are typically playing the position <laughs> he was playing. Yeah. Uh, but but Quinn talks about rebounding as a team and coming back and helping helping rebound. And so that's probably if you're looking for kind of one other area where maybe he can do be a little bit more assertive. And evolve next year. Uh, that might be an area where he helps uh, a little bit more. I know he's a guy yeah. who wants to leak out, and you know because of what he can do in transition as a shooter. Teams love to generate three point shots in transition. The Hawks are just like everybody else that loves to do that, and so it kind of makes sense. But I think that um, you know comparing him to a guy who played literally like two two or three miles from him, Dylan Windler is you know Liz is kind of living on his rebounding to end his three point shooting, but he's a yeah. you know a, an out outlier rebounder for the position he has um but um but but yeah that's that's just something else that i feel like quinn will probably say about everybody on the team everybody that plays at the two and the three is we need more help rebounding and that's probably like i said there's no reason to single him out um but i think that he would say um we need everybody to help rebound and that includes garrison He's part of that. And yeah, I meant to mention earlier when talking about his physicality, like you would think that his physicality would translate into not only rebounds, but also blocks and steals. And like, he doesn't, he's really low on blocks and steals. Like for a guy who fouls as much as he does to also be super, super low in blocks and steals is not what you want. Cause that's like, you, you want to trade that like high foul guys. You should at least trade off and get some stocks. Like it's, yeah. that's part of the trade off. And with him, it's more like, I'm going to draw a charge. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to get a steal. If Kevin were here, he would say it's hard to get a blocker still when you're on the floor. That, and he's 100 percent right about that. <laughs> Kevin's Kevin's a wise man every once in a while. Um, yeah. But no, it's it's the rebounding is what it is, and not to defend him too much. But if he's playing the three, it's you know there's nothing he could do there. Um, I will say they're they are I'm looking at the off, on off some numbers right now. They were better defensively on the glass as a team with him off the court, which is not a huge surprise because like right. you're. His replacements were even if it's Bogey, Bogey's a little bit bigger and probably a better rebounder than Garrison is, and everybody else that would play his position is a better rebounder than him. Yeah, and Sadiq, it's Sadiq and or, Sadiq, Sadiq's like four levels above him as a rebounder. Yeah, Sadiq, and even Hunter, Hunter's right. a be, Hunter. I've made fun of plenty for rebounding. He's a better rebounder than Garrison Matthews. Yeah. So like, and he's just bigger and more, you know, physically yeah. gifted. Yeah, yeah, and and Sadiq is just just has more craft as a rebounder. You know, so so that, that's beat. just a, beats yeah. a lot longer. Like yeah. beat didn't play till the end of the year, but beat, beat just kind of. I mean, I would love to know what, what the wingspan difference between Garrison and Beat is. I bet it's like six inches. That sounds right to me. Maybe yeah. more because Beat's got long arms and he's taller. Uh, Garrison's not exactly yeah. the most long arm guy in the world. So and I don't and, know. and Beat, I mean, this matters as a rebounder. Beat is just a much more fluid athlete than Garrison yeah. is. Right, Garrison is more choppy and. You know, and he's he's pretty strong. What yeah, that's he is pretty strong. We should say that. Yeah. Like he, he's, I think he's more tired on his body to be to get to that level of physicality where he could he can knock he can knock a little bit and be fine. Yeah. But he's and, not a super great athlete. And the and the way the work he does shooting on the move, if you don't have a, like a really strong core, you can't do that stuff, right? It's Agreed. all about core strength. So and, and so I mean, court, like in weird situations, and uh, as much as we talked about his lack of athleticism, I'm glad you mentioned that because. To be able to come off off a curl, let's say, or off a flare screen, and just rise up and not be on balance is really you. Ha you have to have strong legs. You got to have all that stuff that you're talking about to be able right. to shoot up. Because you know you got to square up as well. I'm, I'm sure people watching YouTube make fun of me on, on YouTube for what I'm doing with my body, but it is true. Like you can't just fake that. And right. well, you got to get, get your hips square, and then everything goes from there, right? Right. Our, and... our off balance and his off. You know, off balance could be different things. You have to have balance in your in the way your shooting pocket is. Like your legs could be going one way, but if you got you got to square up, or you or you got no chance. Yeah, I mean, and you know, we we all think back to the standard setter there for the Hawks is you know Corver, um, oh, yeah. and and then the other part of that is I think I think this is always underappreciated in that to be a guy who shoots on the move, conditioning is a major part of that. 
like sprinting in and out, yeah, yep. sprinting in and out of spaces and areas and sprinting to get to the point where you're setting up for the screen and sprinting off the screen. I mean, the amount of conditioning that goes into that, like it's one of the things that I think people sometimes who casually watch Kyle Corwin didn't realize like how much effort he put into his conditioning, sprint, 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 sprint you know, and if you ever watched him even kind of, you know, go through warmups and stuff, a lot of it's sprint to the shot, you know, it's not like a lot of guys just out there just, taking set shots around different parts of the three-point line you know <laughs> that was not he, what he did. It, it was not what he did at all and you can see like um that what garrison has reflects the level of conditioning that he has which is a big part of his shooting capability This show is brought to you by Monopoly Go. And yes, I'm talking about Monopoly Go once again because there's so much good stuff in the Monopoly Go game. In Monopoly Go, you team with friends for time tournaments where you work together to actually build up each other's boards. The more you work together, win together, the more awesome prizes you happen to unlock. And there's so much to unearth at Monopoly Go. You can get unique stickers that you can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes. You can also get cool new playing pieces to travel the boards with or even hilarious emojis that you can use to taunt your friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting each and every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton of that includes their um, unique mini games, like, like digging for treasures or robot particular machines. There also is new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you need to win and rent frenzies. There's also fun stuff to discover all the time at Monopoly Go. Get off the bench now and go. Download the app for free at Google Play or the App Store. Get off the bench right now. It's Game On with Monopoly Go. One more time, it's Monopoly Go. Download for free at Google Play or the App Store. Only you and I could, could probably go. This is longer than we should talk about Garrison Matthews, but you and I could do this all day long. A couple more notes before we get out of here. Uh, I don't want to go crazy about it, but him and DeJounte, Garrison and DeJounte are tight friends by all accounts. Like they... Uh, like each other quite a bit, talk about each other a lot, hang out, hang out. Ironically, that doesn't work on the court, uh, at least this year. They actually, that was his his largest volume of a two-man lineup. So he played more with DeJounte than any other player that he played with this year, talking about Garrison. And they actually had a terrible net rate. They were, nine, they were minus nine or so per 100 possessions. That was the worst two-man group for the Hawks with that many minutes. I don't know if that means anything. It just kind of is what it is. And he was much better with Trey. They were plus four with Garrison and Trey. Does anything strike you like as a basketball fit as to why that would be, or is it just noise? I mean, the sample size is so small, but I don't think it means that much. But does that mean anything to you? Was that like strike anything in your head of like why he'd be better with Trey than Dejounte? Well, I mean, the thing that jumps out to me, and this is not a dig at Dejounte, Trey is as good as it gets at feeding shooters. That's right? true. So uh, you know his the his Trey's method of distribution and the way he kind of activates shooters is just different. Dejounte wants to try to collapse the defense with his getting to the nail, getting to kind of that little pull up left of the, of the, you know, and so there's just a completely different spacing concept with DeJounte. And, and so for me, it's like, um, yeah, Trey's a more dynamic passer. Trey's one of the single best passers in the league. He's one of the best, um, you know, facilitators of shooters in the league. And that doesn't mean DeJounte is terrible at it. DeJounte no. just operates a completely different, you know, kind of way. The Trey, so that that's what jumps out to me. I don't, I don't know if I can look at Bogey, how Bogey did with the shot. I mean, Bogey could get create his own shot, so it's almost it's not nearly as impactful to a guy like him. But it's weird because I always felt like we've talked about this a little bit. I think in different places, DeAndre was way better with Dejounte down the stretch. Yeah, you agreed. know, um, but 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 again, Dejounte is kind of, or sorry, DeAndre is kind of taking different path to the ball. He's relocating kind of sometimes inside the three point line, you know, and, and those sorts of things, which is just different than, you know, we all think back to the Eastern conference finals run where it was Trey working with Gallo in the pit in the pick and pop. And then bogey set up over here and heard her set up like the Hawks have never created that level of shooting ever since that was, that, that was the only time in that three month right. period was the only time they ever did it. Yep. That's right. right. And so, and I, and I mean, and ever since Gallo left Atlanta, you know, I know there, there's been some physical issues, but I mean, he and Trey were like, I mean, absolutely impossible. Perfectly simple. So, yeah, no, and I, I especially the, the next year after that, I was ranting and raving all year long about how they just didn't have enough shooting. And it was, I, it was so obvious to me that, that was why yeah. they were not the same team. Yeah. And the same case can be made now. They, I mean, you know, Garrison's part of the solution. He's a, he's a really good shooter, but they still don't have like, they have enough shooting. If you look at it, it's like, okay, this guy can shoot a little bit. This guy can shoot. Nobody's a bad shooter other than, the center spots that right. they have in the rotation right now, but it's like, they don't have 
the high level know, shooting. Yeah. The, yeah, the the formula of Trey, three high level shooters and a center, they had never gotten to that on a regular yeah. basis since yeah. that run. I know it, it's this is a rant I often get on, but like they made the Eastern Conference Finals run. Nate got the job, hired us a whole new coaching staff, completely changed the offense. And I still, it's, this is ridiculous, but I remember <laughs> that year of the Eastern, Eastern Conference Finals run, if you go look, their efficiency and spot ups, they were second in the league in um, spot up efficiency. That's next season, they were 29. They were from second to 29th yeah. in the league of spot up efficiency. And part of and that was personnel. Part of that was, was what they were running too. It was, it was all. It was both. It was definitely yeah. both. And they've never gotten that back on track. You know, I mean, I, th- I think the Sadiq trade, I mean, Sadiq like, could, felt like he made one shot a month for <laughs> the first half of the season. Well, you know? And ironically, the, the year before when he came in, he shot like 41% and like was yeah. hot. Like when he yeah. got post trade, he shot really well. And then this year, pre injury, it just wasn't happening for him. So, I mean, a yeah. lot of that too is just playing with Jalen. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, he played a lot of power forward last year, a ton yeah. of power forward last year, right? Last season. And this year it was more at the three, and it was just a little bit different, making room for Jalen. Jalen was prioritized on offense, and so kind of that was there. And uh, and but that's to me, it's like if you look at how do we build this back up around, you know, Trey. It's you know, can you get a, sh- a shooter at the five that's in the mix? You know, um, it would be interesting. It can. Do they need to add a guy at the three four who is more of a like really really high level shooter? Than they have right now. I mean, if you look at what Quinn wants to do offensively, it's an imperative, and that's one of the things so going to make this this offseason so so interesting. But that's where I think Garrison. You know, we talked about this with Bruno. Bruno gives them flexibility going the next season if they want to go make major changes at the center position. Bruno's solid enough to like kind of let you take a swing at remaking that position. Garrison's a good fallback player to be your yep. you know fifth wing or what or whatever you want to call it. You know in the rotation because he's solid enough and he's, he does the basics well enough and he can make shots and all that sort of stuff. So um, that's, that's, a, a, he has a value in that yeah. way that, that they can take a swing at trying to kind of do something different on the wing and, and know like, Hey, you know, Garrison won't get us killed in any of his minutes. You know, that's, and that's, that may sound like nothing, but it's not nothing. No, that matters. And this, that's actually the last thing I wanted to do before we get out of here on Garrison, just kind of tee it up because he has a $2.2 million team option for this coming season that's also non-guaranteed. So it's incredibly team friendly. What do you um, see the date? Do you see the date on that? I do have the date. So the option deadline is June 29th. So they have to decide okay. on the option, but then he's not guaranteed till January 10th. Okay. So honestly, it would, it would be criminal to decline the option. For sure. Because even, even if they didn't want to keep him, it would be silly to decline the option on a non-guaranteed contract for what yeah. he is. And for okay. me, Given how cheap that is, I think that, you know, look, if if, you, if there's a trade you want to make and you have to slide him in there, you, you go ahead and do it. I'm not saying that he would be untouchable there or anything like that. But it's, if it's if it's simply a decision of do you want Garrison Matthews for $2.2 million, for me it's a pretty easy yes. But it's Same. it's extremely not it's extremely team friendly his contract, which is part of the reason that we talked about with Bruno on that Bruno podcast. But that was a really sneaky good trade. Obviously not going to change your trajectory as a franchise or winning championships or anything like that, but it was, it was a good trade. Um so yeah, I mean, I think that's a it's a valuable piece. Um, we'll see what that looks like. I don't think that you mentioned him as like a fifth wing type. That's my guess for what it's going to be going into next year. I, I don't think that we're going to go into October if they are healthy and we'll be saying Garrison's guaranteed to play because I I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to do some other stuff around him. Um, maybe he's in a battle with AJ Griffin for uh, the tenth man spot or something like that. Maybe he's in a battle with a rookie. Maybe he's in a battle with someone that's outside the organization. But if he's on the team, this is my pseudo prediction, Glenn. If he's on the team, he'll play 700 minutes, just because he will. It's just what's going to happen. He, he's he's a he's a too valuable of a 12th man kind of guy to have around to not play eventually because somebody's somebody will get hurt. You'll leave the shooting or whatever it's going to be. Yeah, and he's he's a professional, right? Yeah, and you know, and and that's the thing. And teams need like there are times when you're like, oh, we're down 16 points, eight minutes to go. I didn't know a shooter. Hey, Garrison, like, you know, we're, we're putting you in on, on the floor as another shooter and you go smaller. He's a guy that when you go smaller to try to kind of play from behind, he's an option to kind of, Hey, yeah, let's put you out there, kind of see what you have. And I mean, he's a, he, he's a guy that should be playing in that 600, 800 minutes a year kind of range. And he, he can make a good living six, seven, eight years kind of in that kind of role, you know? Yep. Um, 
if now if Garrison were sitting here, he'd be like, guys, I'm better than that. And I mean, because right, that's, that's, that. that's the mentality he should have. He absolutely <laughs> should be. I can do more. Um, and if he does develop the ability to kind of be a little more dynamic, attacking closeouts, being a little a bit better on the read, uh, determining whether to take a charge against the ball handler or not. Like those are the things that might move the needle up, you know, and if he does show that, then he, he might prove us wrong and it'd be worth 1100, 1200 minutes here. If he can kind of improve in those areas where he needs to improve to, to more, a little bit more kind of prioritization in the rotation. But I mean, yeah. like I said, successful season, Met sure. expectations, probably exceeded expectations a little bit in the last couple of months showed that he was leaning into the coaching asks of him. And I, I think that's all you can ask. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think he is one of the guys on the roster you would say at the very least had a season that was solidly where he was supposed to be, if not better. And that's yep. all you can ask from a guy like that off your bench. And again, on a very team-friendly contract that goes into next year as well. All right, Glenn, we've gone 45 minutes on Garrison Matthews because only Crazy. you and I could do that. Uh, we'll sign off now, but anything to plug on this fine Thursday into Friday? No, come find us on Twitter on Sunday. Um, spaces there. And um, so that'll, that should be fun. We want to kind of talk through, talk through that. And, you know, if you haven't heard, you know, Kevin and I did a second round preview of sorts on the 18 on 29. If you haven't caught that yet, you can go see how right or and wrong we were in different <laughs> areas of that because they were kind of into the different playoffs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but like I, like I said last time, I'm just enjoying being able to watch a little more of the playoffs, you know, with, with the Hawks uh, being inactive. Not not what fans wanted, not what the organization <laughs> wanted, but a little different right. experience to uh, kind of be able to take in uh, kind of more what we're seeing there. And then this is, I mean, watching Tibbs now, is he going to play six players <laughs> in the next, like, Five. you know, what's going on there? Um, looking at Denver, looked like a complete. I mean, so it's it's a just a fascinating playoffs, and so you know, if you want to talk about the NBA playoffs, come find me on Twitter at Will underscore Glenn, and happy to talk about it. Yeah, we're recording this uh, on Thursday night, and as we speak, Cleveland's up twelve at the, end, at the end of the third quarter against Boston. Maybe they'll blow it, but that would be an interesting result in itself in Boston in Game Two. So, plenty to get to. Thanks for being here, Glenn. As always, we will yeah. have more player capsules coming as much as I, as long as I can keep convincing Glenn to come on the podcast. We got more guys to talk about. As the summer goes along, again, one more plug to the lottery on Sunday afternoon. That'll create a lot of content for us and uh, we're ramping up things. It'll get busier and busier between now and late June. So thanks for being here, everybody. Really appreciate it. Please subscribe to this show. Subscribe to ATL on 29. We'll see you guys next time.